Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Voices from Japan National Security Speaker Series. We are letting everyone in to the um, into the uh, this uh, webinar um, conference room. So if you could wait for a couple of more minutes, uh, we will get started. Thank you. Again, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Voices from Japan National Security Speaker Series. We are still waiting to uh, let all the uh, all of those uh, who have registered for this event to come into this uh, webinar webinar room. So we're going to get started in about three minutes.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the good morning to those of you who are channeling in from the uh, United States and good evening for those of you who have uh, signed up on this, uh, who, who have queuing in from uh, Japan and the rest of Asia. Welcome to Voices from Japan National Security Speaker Series. This is the uh, this has started as an annual event uh, pre pre pandemic, where uh, we would host the uh, senior Japanese strategic thinkers to uh, visit Washington DC actually in person and share with us their thoughts on the uh, future of Japanese security and US Japan alliance. However, for the last couple of years, due to the uh, restriction travel restriction and other in person meeting restriction due to COVID pandemic, we have re reimagined this series to uh, replace the in-person meeting with a series of the uh, webinars. And we, I am extremely honored to welcome um, two uh, highly respected uh, military officers, Japanese and American, to join us for the discussion of the, the future of a US-Japan Defense Corporation, particularly focusing on the air and aerospace. From Japan, um, we, have a, we have a General Shunji Izutsu, uh, from uh, Japanese uh, Japanese Air Self Defense Force, he's currently serving as a Chief of Staff of JASTAF, and previously he served as the uh, Commander of the Air Defense Command at Yokota, uh, which uh, which uh, JASTAF co-locates with the U.S. Fifth Air, Air Force. And prior to that, he served as the uh, Commander of the Western Air Defense Force. He has also served as the Director of Personnel and Education in the Air Staff Office and was Vice Commander of the Southwestern Air Division in Naha as well. From the United States, I'm extremely again honored to welcome Lieutenant General Kevin Schneider, who's currently serving as the Director of Staff as the United States Air Force. Lieutenant General Schneider was previously the commander of the United Forces in Japan and commander of the 5th Air Force at Yokota. So General Izutsu and the General, Lieutenant General Schneider had worked closely together as their counterpart as, their, as they serve at Yokota at the first time um, for the last assignment. His staff assignment, General Schneider's staff assignment includes tours on the Joint Staff, Air Staff, US Air Force Central Command and Pacific Air Forces. He was also previously the chief of staff at the headquarters at the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Camp Smith, Hawaii. Again, I'm extremely honored to uh, welcome welcome two generals, and uh, I would uh, like to go ahead and write and get started. And uh, General Izutsu, I would like to start with you um, by posing my. Uh, oh, and then before, let's not forget before I be we begin. Um, please, uh, please allow me to go over some ground rules. Um, this is again webinar. Once the way it's going to work is I am going to pose General Izutsu and Lieutenant General Schneider two opening questions, and after we hear their um, after hear their remarks and responses to those questions, we will open up to a general Q and A with the audience. When you do, please do not use the chat. Uh, for, for those of you who are in the audience, please only use Q&A box to pose your questions. I cannot monitor both Q&A and chat windows, so I would only pick up the questions that are posted on the Q&A. And then I would like to, I would, I would try to um, pick up as many questions as you can. And we will promptly end this session at uh, 9 o'clock um, Eastern, Eastern Daylight Saving Time and uh, uh, 10 p.m. on the uh, on the uh, Japan time. So welcome generals. Thank you so much for joining us this, uh, this morning and this evening. Let me start uh, by asking you the question, General Izutsu. Before you uh, became the chief of staff, you served in a few positions that have been critical to Japan's defense, including vice commander of the Southwestern Com Composite Air Division and also um, also uh, Air Defense Command. And this really overlaps with uh, when China began to increase its air activities, both in, in its uh, quantity and its quality over the East China Sea. So later as a strategic competition, so late, lately as a strategic competition between the United States and China is has been intensifying in the Pacific region, um, how do you see the changes in the strategic, strategic environment that the JASF has been facing over the last 10 years? 
Oh, thank you for inviting me as a panelist today. Oh, I'm Jerry Izutsu, uh, Chief of Staff of the Japan yeah, Safe Force, also known as the Koku Jetai. It's a great honor to be a panelist of this webinar held by Smith uh, Stimson Center, one of the leading think tank in the United States. And I reiterate my appreciation to Ms. Tatsumi, our co director of East Asia Program for Prior Coordination to hold. Uh, this webinar. And I'm also happy to talk with Lieutenant General Schneider, the former commander of the US Force Japan again. Oh, by the way, my call sign is Bert, and Lieutenant General Schneider is Gambi. So we have been calling each other by Bert and Gambi. Uh, with that further ado, uh, let's move on to today's main topic, uh, as Tatsumi san told me. Uh, dating back to more than 10 years, approximately 15 years ago from 2006 to 2008, I was chief of the defense plant and policy section of Air, Self, uh, Air Staff Office of the Koku Jietai. The defense plant and the policy section of Air Staff Office is a section responsible for future tactics and long-term and mid-term defense capability building of the Koku Jietai. In fact, China's rapid increasing defense budget and its lack of transparency was already recognized. And then, for instance, we recognized the number of the latest fighter aircraft at that time in China was almost equal to or already surpassed that of Japan. Uh, but such matter was never seriously discussed because no one could have asserted that China would become such a security concern at that moment. Oh, this reflects the Bush administration's uh, address in 2005 that China should become a, a responsible stakeholder. Therefore, oh, there was no atmosphere in Japan to discuss our defense budget increase, and the situation rather looked like a sluggish or procurement holiday. Or oh, nevertheless, until now, China became neither a democracy nor responsible stakeholder, although Lipset theory anticipates a democratization associated with an increased national income. And while I was in the position of a commander, Air Defense Command, China's intense aviation activity was being continued, and China Russia long distance joint flight was carried out in 2019 and 2020. Under such circumstances, as pointed out, our China activities started to become more active, especially in the East China Sea from around 2012, when I was a vice commander of the Southwestern Composite Air Division. Incessant activities of Chinese naval vessels continued and fighter and reconnaissance aircraft increased their operations. Those activities not only took place in the East China Sea, but expanded to the Pacific Ocean through the Miyako Strait between Okinawa Island and Miyakojima Island. In 2017, a Chinese aircraft passed through the Tsushima Strait and advanced to the Sea of Japan. Moreover, in 2013, China announced to establish the East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone and to adapt uh, defensive emergency measures in case of a flight plan is not submitted. But however, in the first place, an air defense identification zone or AEDIS is the area where each country's air force identifies aircraft by surveillance. And it is not the area to require a flight plan, such as Flight Information Region, FIR. On the other hand, it was a period when Japan, US bilateral efforts started to become effective. The CBP, Continuous Bomber Presence, or BTF, Bomber Task Force of the US and Japan, US bilateral exercise carried out on that occasion, definitely well transmitted a strong message that we don't allow unilateral change of the status quo by force. 
as not only Japan and the United States, but also the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand operate bases and patrol aircraft in the Eastern China Sea for UN resolution based surveillance activities against ship to ship transfer uh, by North Korea vessels. Our efforts arguably uh, contributed to stability of the East China Sea as well. And moreover, uh, many countries, including Japan and the United States, protested against China's misunderstanding on the establishment of the AIDS. After that, there has been no information that the Ministry of National Defense of China revokes its public announcement of the AIDS. But the NOTAM, Notice Airmen, about defensive emergency measure was canceled. And the defensive emergency measure is not written in Chinese AIP, Aeronautical Information Publication. Or to sum it up, the activities of Chinese aircraft in the East China Sea, of which the sign was already seen 15 years ago, has uh, become obvious since 10 years ago. And its quantity and quality are largely increased, exemplifying the commission of the aircraft carrier and the China Russia long distance joint flight. However, uh, against such unilateral attempts to change the status quo by force, Japan and the United States, as well as Australia, France, the UK, Germany, and more nations are uh, relentlessly transmitting a strong message for the freedom of navigation. China intensifies its activities in the East China Sea and attempts to establish its illegal recrimination as a fate accomplished in the South China Sea. As stable development of the Indo-Pacific region is indispensable for the world stability and prosperity, the principle of the free and open in the Pacific for it must be realized. A Chinese, China's activities disrespecting industrial rules are observed not only in the air and maritime domains, but also in cyber and space domain. It is difficult for a single country to handle it. So like-minded states with Japan and the United States at its core, need to cooperate together to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, General Izitsu. So, um, Lieutenant General Schneider, let me flip this question to you. So, how did you see also, as you were serving all these uh, various um, um, command assignments in the Indo-Pacific region, um, culminating in the U.S. Forces Japan Fifth Air, Air Force Commander, how did you see? How do you see the strategic environment has evolved in your AOR during your times in the region? Uh, th thank you for the, very much for the question, and General Izutsu. It is great to see you again, sir. Uh, for the for the audience, um, it was not not brought up, but General Izutsu is a master model builder, and one of the gifts that I treasure the most is that he uh, he built uh, an F-16 model and an F-4 model, the airplanes that we both flew uh, during our careers, and, and presented that to me. It's always held a place of honor. Um, my my personal effects have not arrived, but sir, as soon as that does, that uh, those those gifts and the models that you built will have a, a place of honor here in the office. But it's good to see you, sir. Uh, to, to your question, yeah. So I I arrived in the Pacific in about 2015, and then spent the next six and a half years in a very variety of assignments. When I would receive U.S dignitaries to Japan as the commander of USFJ and Fifth Air Force, I would highlight that the strategic environment that is surrounds Japan on three sides is not just an issue for Japan, and it's not just an issue for the United States or for the alliance, but it's an issue for the world. And in no other place, no other region, no other area, are there so many strategic challenges focused um, and concentrated to the north Russia. And we watched over the years or during my, my short tenure um, in the Pacific, 
you know, Russia continuing to militarize and to build up their military capability in the in their far eastern military district, and that is manifesting them that um, with a military buildup in the northern territories and the Kuril, uh, which continues to get stronger and and more noticeable each day. Uh, North Korea, and there is a, certainly a lot of focus in the about the 2016 to 2017 timeframe about North Korea's uh, nuclear uh, buildup and mil and uh, ballistic missile uh, buildup. Um, and while some of that has gone quiet in the last couple of years, or you, we don't talk about it as much, it is obvious, certainly from the parades, uh, what's being displayed in parades, what's taking on with, with continued military uh, uh, missile testing, uh, that North Korea did not take a procurement holiday. Uh, they are continuing to advance in, in uh, their capabilities from the short range to the long range to the uh, intercontinental range. Uh, type of capabilities, and we cannot afford to take our eye off the ball there. And then China, for every and I absolutely, uh, you know, everything that General Zutsu said, um, I, and I, I won't do justice by trying to trying to recap. But in just the from the 2013 establishment of the East China Sea ADIS uh, to the land reclamation that took place in the South China Sea, the militarization of those outposts, despite you know, Chairman Xi promising the president in the Rose Garden in 2015 that there would be no militarization. We now have you know, significant military out, Chinese have significant military outposts in the South China Sea um, to their continued massive military buildup um, of fighter aircraft, ships, submarines, but certainly their, their uh, ballistic missiles, hypersonics and all the other things that they're doing uh, to include space and beyond. But uh, Really, to what uh, General Izutsu said, it's the scope and scale of what uh, the, the PLA has been doing over the last few years uh, should really be uh, getting our attention. And it's not just in, in the military uh, spectrum as well. Uh, economic, you know, some of the malign activities that were taking place as a result of one belt and one road, um, you know, in the economics uh, 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 sphere. Uh, the, the Chinese use of what I'll call law, lawfare um, and trying to um, take advantage of, of weaker nations or others uh, through through legal means uh, in almost a vassal type of a relationship. And then what they're doing in both cyberspace and space, um, uh, extraterrestrial space uh, in terms of gray zone activities to continue to, to try to influence and um, and do things that are that are pressing or exceeding what I would call the uh, the international rules-based order or the the norms by which you know the the free world and society has operated successfully uh, over seventy plus years. And when you look at it and see that perhaps no other nation than China has benefited by the rules the international rules-based order over the last you know seven plus decades, but now. It, given their position, they're looking to rewrite those rules in a way that benefits themselves at the expense of others. And I think that's the thing that has stuck out most uh, to me in the last you know, six and a half years is that transition to, to the rewriting of the rules-based international order. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your thoughts, uh, Generals. Um, Lieutenant General Schneider, let me uh, ask the next question to you first, and because um, the uh, second question that I posed that uh, General Izutsu actually nicely ties, um, makes a tie way, say, a tie to kind of like piggyback nicely onto this. And with given all those uh, challenges that both that you and General Izutsu share, the evolution of the strategic environment, where do you see the challenges to further deepen um, US Japan air to air? cooperation moving forward? Again, thank you for, for the question. I, and I may reframe it just a little bit. You'll never have me back because I keep changing changing your questions on you. I, I look at more as opportunities. Uh, the, the challenges are in front of us, and, and I think we, we, we covered those. But the things that I think collectively we, we need to do, a bilateral relationship between Koku Jitai and U.S. Air Force, and I may deviate a little bit from, from the norm here, of the, and these are personal opinions. And I think first, well, interoperability. We have got to find ways, we have, must take advantage of uh, ways to increase our interoperability. We fly similar systems and platforms, F-35, F-15, et cetera, but 
just because we fly the same platforms doesn't necessarily mean that we are interoperable from the start. We must, must do more. So specifically, uh, when I was at USFJ and Fifth Air Force, I, I really pushed hard to, for training and readiness now. Uh, we've, we've got to do more with what we have today. And while it's great that we are buying advanced systems and looking forward into the future, we have to be ready today. And much of the training, much of the high-end training that we do between U.S. Air Force and Koku Jetai takes place outside of Japan. So whether it's red flag exercises we both participate in in Alaska, the, the fantastic Koku North exercises that take place down in Guam are great. But we have to go on the road to do that. Are there ways that we could do those type of high-end events in Japan? And I understand that that comes with a cost. And I understand that uh, lo local understanding and the sensitivities, but the challenges that are sitting on the front doorstep right now, I think drive us to have those, ought to drive us to have, have those conversations. The, the second piece is, has to do with exercises um, you know, beyond just you know the red flags and the Coke North, but driving speed and realism and flexibility. And there's a couple of subsets to that. One is agile combat employment, you know, how we are going to fight and work together and, and things that we ought to be doing every day, as well as the command and control structure. It's a bilateral command and control structure per the Alliance, but are there ways that we can continue to, to literally you know, exercise, the, build that connective tissue, exercise that muscle memory, put in place those systems uh, so that you know when crisis or conflict happens that we are not doing anything different. We're just doing the same things that we do every day, but just at a higher volume. And then the third piece of it was, you know, the, the continued acquisitions and development of systems, whether we buy the same systems or we buy compatible systems or complementary systems, but looking at our long range plan, does it make sense for us to buy the same stuff or are there things that you, the United States can buy that have a certain capability and Japan can buy complementary systems that have a different capability but together, we we are able to cover the range of options and capabilities that we would need in conflict or crisis. And again, I, I rambled a little bit too long on you, but uh, thank thank you for the opportunity to, to answer that one. Thank you. I like the way that you reframe my question from a challenges to opportunities. Um, if you recall, um, that's what the uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Koizumi, used to say that we'll flip challenges into op future opportunities. So I really like that. <laughs> So following the uh, what the General Schneider said, uh, General Izutsu, moving forward with all these uh, opportunities that he highlighted, uh, what do you think are the most important issues that the JASDA faces in short, medium, and long term? And what are your thoughts on the uh, um, Japan-U.S. Uh, Defense Corporation on the you know air-to-air -air component um, to how, I guess, uh, in my borrowing the uh, terminology from uh, General Schneider, how do you think we should, we can, you can change those challenges into the opportunities for future corporations? Thank you, Satsumi-san. Uh, actually, uh, these are very tough issues and a tough question for me. Uh, but uh, let me say what we can do in short term is uh, limited. It can be uh, broadly categorized into software and hard uh, hardware perspective. Or hardware means equipment. As a Kokujeta is working for procurement of F-35 and trying to procure factory MSC, increase the number of C2 and introduce E2 and KC-46A at this moment, we need to make every effort to on schedule acquisition, preferably ahead of schedule. A delay in the program is fatal, taking account of real time for building units and educating personnel after acquisition of equipment. Our software means review of operations and Japan-US joint response procedure, et cetera. Why Japan's joint response capability are being apparently improved through Japan-US bilateral joint exercise, such as Kinech, or command post exercise, and KinSword, uh, field training exercise, et cetera. But there are also some challenges to take up from now on. Among the challenges, we need to focus on and complete those that are important or can be resolved with uh, comparatively less working effort. 
The important point uh, in these short-term matter is not just that we can expect an improvement of defense capability in relatively short term, but also that we will form a solid deterrence. With the Japan-US alliance at its axis, it is important that we, Japan, deter firmly. On one of our midterm challenge is to enhance our capabilities in so-called new domain, namely space, cyber, and electromagnetic domain. Also, training our ability beyond the line of sight has become crucial in conventional domains because Japan intends to have standoff defense capability. I personally believe oh, ABC to EF and uh, STU are the important field. A stands for AI. AI can be more than the technology essential for uncrewed aerial vehicle UAV. AI can be applied to the co-cujeta infrastructure judge system by embedding a function to help intercept controllers and commanders make a decision and determination or to our daily administrative procedures. B stands for beam detection weapon. Beam detection weapon is a so-called non-kinetic weapon and high power microwave or laser could be a game changer against a saturation attack with drones and cruise missiles. And C2 uh, stands for 2C, namely cyber warfare and cognitive warfare. In cyber warfare, considering difficulty to defend all of our system, we need to think of securing a cheaper and improvised alternative method and countermeasure against cyber attack. We need to enhance electric uh, warfare capability as well. Cognitive warfare is more like a concept that includes information operation and information warfare rather than either of these. EF stands for employment of force. It is a similar concept to Yusuf's ACE, agile combat development, but a more comprehensive idea including enhancement of interoperability and maneuver and deployment capabilities through rotational training of the Koku JTIs F-35 in the US or Australia. S stands for space. The Koku JTI plan to scale up units and assets appropri uh, appropriately while reinforcing space capabilities. T stands for targeting. In accordance with the introduction of long distance guide missiles, uh, it is needed to get target information beyond the line of sight in an accurate and real time manner. Therefore, utilization, uh, utilization of information acquired from any domain, including the space domain, is important. The last U stands for uncrewed or less workforce system. UAV represents this, and the Kokujeta is having a study for radar equipment, or radar equipment that enables almost uncrewed operations. But this is an essential future technology, not only for armed force. Considering allocation of limited human resource, difficulty of increase in parcel, amid age population, and time consuming training for personnel to deal with high-tech equipment. And finally, oh, our long-term challenges. I believe they are inevitably uh, philosophical in a way. So far, oh, we have experienced a cat and mouse game. On one hand, we saw temporarily relaxed tension such as a China illusion stated in deep set theory and the peace Divided after the collapse of the Soviet Union while enjoying a procurement holiday. On the other hand, uh, surrounding nations, especially China, have grown in power. Therefore, 
we need to enhance deterrence in long term by overcoming the mid term defense capability challenges. In addition to uh, China's rising national power uh, based on President Xi's reinforcement of his power base in Chinese Communist Party as general secretary and the seizure of more power as the chairman of the Central Military Commission. China's move to modernization military may be accelerated. Uh, since neither public, private, nor military civilian borders can be drawn in the field of space and cyber, even the non-state actor may become a th uh, threat. Or while we surely sustain solid deterrence and response capability in conventional domains, we must well invest resources in space and cyber as well to secure not only Japan's, but also global security. The key is innovation of technology, regardless of public, private, or military civilian borders boundaries. The innovation of technology shall include not only pursuit of new technology, but also manufacturing revolution, namely in ability to manufacture at extremely low cost in a short period. A security policy is like a life and health insurance for a family. We must avoid the situation where we pay high premium, but nevertheless receive low refund after catching a disease. Thank you much. Thank you. As uh, as uh, both of you have been responding to my uh, two opening questions, I think audience uh, audience have been uh, pouring me in and almost flooding me with the uh, questions. So let me just start right ahead. So as of, uh, as as I'm sure both of you are. Um, with, um, monitoring this week the uh, DOD released the uh, 2021 annual report um, to the Congress on the uh, Chinese military power and the report. Um, the reports specifically indicated the large increase in the Chinese strategic nuclear forces, including an increase by a factor of four in its uh, strategic nu nuclear nuclear forces potentially by 2030. So to I guess uh, this uh, first question I think goes more toward the General Schneider. So what changes and maybe to both of you to the extent possible, what changes in the US and Japanese force should be considered to maintain the effective deterrence, which both of you highlighted as the key to counter the, counter the uh, more sort of China and to prevent China from using these capabilities um, for, um, for diplomatic coercion and specifically for uh, General Izutsu. Um, given this uh, incre increase and expansion of the uh, Chinese uh, nuclear forces, would Japan be comfortable if the US moved to a sole purpose nuclear weapon policy? And of course, to the extent possible, I'll appreciate it if, uh, if uh, both of you share your thoughts on this. So I think let me start uh, with you, General Schneider, and then um, go to uh, General Izutsu. Certainly, thank, and again, thank you for the question. Um, and I'll probably just, the things that I say will not come as a shock and I'm probably just restating the obvious, but our nuclear deterrence underwrites and assures all forms of conventional deterrence. So within the United States, and you've seen the, you've seen the discussions and they will start to take, take place, uh, continue to take place and you're, you're seeing them on Capitol Hill as well about the recapitalization of our of nuclear capability across the, the joint force, not just the United States Air Force, uh, to ensure that we have that that solid you know um, foundation of, of nuclear deterrence, because it allows with that in place, it continues to allow every other form of deterrence to to, to be a, to be effective. Personal opinion, and I'll uh, I'll couch it as that. What we're seeing out of China now is a, is a recognition that they have to do the same, and I I see that their my assumption is that their their significant buildup of nuclear capability, and I, I think that what that was going to continue to unfold into the future is they are going to to build the capability that um, allows them to have or to desire to have the same sort of capability that with with a nuclear deterrent foundation, then they have the ability to to do uh, 
much, many more options in terms of the in the, in the conventional realm. Um, so we're obviously watching that closely. Uh, we'll continue to see what what comes out in terms of uh, guidance from our, our national leadership as to how we how we uh, deal with that and how we develop options to to counter that. Thank you. Thank you, General Schneider. General Izutsu. Thank you for uh, asking a question. But uh, however, regarding the nuclear policy, I'd like to refrain from expressing my personal view here. But uh, let me say a little. Uh, it reminds me of very, very old day, about uh, 40 years ago, when uh, I was a cadet of National Defense Academy. In the academy, we learned uh, nuclear deterrence policy in NATO. First, NATO adopted uh, tripwire warfare. Second, moved to uh, flexible uh, response policy. Uh, it was about uh, four years ago. And uh, nearly 20 years ago, I was a master degree student in the United States. At that time, I learned or uh, sign up how to calculate the number of nuclear warheads of the United States against the uh, Soviet Union. And another point, another thing I was very expressed was a uh, Nam Ruga Pact or uh, two. A senator uh, submitted uh, the law, which enables the uh, funding to three the former Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet Union nations to denuclearization. China, at least, has been long time a nuclear power, and we, we are not sure what China is, what China wants to do. But uh, we have learned. Uh, during so long time regarding the nuclear policy and warfare. So it could be a time to review of what we have achieved or what we have done, I think. Thank you both. Um, in that, in this uh, line of uh, question, I think I have a, some uh, auxiliary question, a supplement question that are coming in on this uh, general theme of the, um, the expansion and impact of the uh, Chinese uh, nuclear force expansion. So, given that all these uh, within, the, given that uh, both of uh, both, of course, JASF bases, but then of course, you know, we do have bases, um, Yokota, Misawa, all those bases lie within the range of Chinese missile arsenal, nuclear and conventional. Could could uh, either of you speak a little bit to the efforts of a hardening bases? To uh, to continue operations under under the uh, stressed environment, and any thoughts of dispersing operations to other remote sites, um, particularly in the uh, south um, along the uh, southwest islands. I Should can I? Take the, yes, I can take the first one uh, attempt at answering that one. And I guess the, the short answer to the question is yes to, to all of the above. And not only China, the you know the same is true for for DPRK. You know as they continue to build up their arsenal, uh, you know short range capability, short range missiles launched from the DPRK can touch Japan. Um, they don't have to be long range. So yeah, there is there are a number of threat fans and missile envelopes from from three different directions: China, DPRK, and Russia that that touch Japan. So because of that, there is a hard look you know, at how we make our forces collectively more survivable, you know, whether that is hardening of bases, uh, increasing of uh, air defense capability as uh, to also to include dispersion, um, to, to find other operating locations to move around quickly uh, and to, to prevent uh, targeting challenges for, for enemy forces. So yes. All that is being considered, all that's being worked, and we are going through options to exercise and validate the, you know, the effectiveness uh, again and the cost of, of each of those options. Uh, none, none of those, you know, come come without a, a price, and we're trying to figure out the, the best way to go forward. But at the same time, the best way to do it together, and as generally Zutsu, um, again, I applaud him for for this when we were going through some of the initial stages of agile combat employment, being able to move our forces around quickly, uh, reconstitute them and pulse them out, um, that he was uh, deeply involved uh, committing uh, Koku Jetai assets and bases uh, and locations to, to helping us develop this uh, these tactics, techniques and procedures. So whatever we do, we must do together and we are going in that direction. Over. 
Thank you. General Izutsu, do you have anything to add? Yes, let me, uh, let me add a little. Uh, as General Schneider Gambi san uh, said, uh, our Kokujeta is also engaging the AIDS, agile combat engagement. And uh, it is uh, difficult or it is uh, impossible to harden our fixed target, uh, fixed assets, uh, because they are easily uh, targeted. So only two answers for that. One is moving, and the second, uh, maneuvering, and the second, uh, dispersed. As you can easily recognize, Japan archipelago is very thin, although it's long to south to uh, north to south or east to west. So utilizing uh, many airfields, uh, dispersing, and a uh, conduct operation in a maneuvering manner is very, very important. But on the other hand, these sound not so difficult, but uh, requiring or rearmament or establishing a mesh of a C2 system is uh, our challenges. So we have to figure out what's a real problem or challenges. And with the United States Air Force and any services, we have to realize uh, such a maneuvering and disperse operation concept called ACE. Uh, in Japan and surrounding areas, I think. Thank you both. Um, next question is: um, We talked. We 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 uh, we talk a lot. Both of you have um, uh, shared a lot of um, your thoughts on the uh, how to deter um, China, but. What uh, one of the scenario that I think we all are uh, very concerned about happening is the uh, um, incident or accident um, that could um, escalate out of control. And then I think um, it has first become um, more noticeable in a maritime domain, but I think it's more so in the uh, increasingly so in the air domain now. And in order to, but then also on the other hand, as General Izuzu shared with us, um, China has been canceling NOTAM and taking all these unilateral measures as well to make it actually less safe. And so in that light of that, can both of you share with the audience a little bit about the status of uh, you, each of your services um, consultation or dialogue or meeting with the PLA Air Force? Um, probably, I should probably uh, go to uh, General Schneider first, and uh, Mr. Um, and then in the meantime, General Izuzu can uh, <laughs> buy a little bit of give him a little bit of time to collect his thoughts. Yeah, certainly, yeah, and, and that has uh, waxed and, and waned over the years. Yeah, there, there is a standing dialogue uh, between Air Forces, um, both U.S. Air Force and then PLA Air Force and PLA Navy. Uh, the, that would meet uh, twice a year, once at the general officer level and once at the uh, 06 or the, or the colonel level. And it was a forum that we could go sit down in a room together face to face and go, this happened on such and such a date. We felt that this in, uh, encounter was unsafe or unprofessional. You know, what are you going to do about it? And, and, and vice versa. And, and while it, you know, the interactions weren't all, my term, you know, you may not find them completely satisfactory or, or, you know, mutual understanding may not have been achieved. At least there was a dialogue and at least there was that co connective tissue and conduit of, in of information. Um, and at times we did see changes that made in, um, in terms of tactics, techniques or procedures that has uh, dried up a little bit over the last couple of years for, for a number of reasons. And that's, uh, should cause us a little bit of concern, you know, that despite the the frictions that we have at the diplomatic or political levels, one of the things I think that has kept um, ensured communications and ensured uh, stability in times of crisis is the the mill to mill dialogues that happen through throughout the world. So that is something I think that both sides need to continue to to, uh, to work towards. And I again I put this on on the PLA. Uh, to pick this up where they have dropped off and, and re-enter these dialogues so that we, we do have that conduit of information of, of ways to share and an opportunity to de-escalate or to prevent a, an incident from turning into a to a, a, a conflict or, or some sort of a shooting war. Thank you. Thank you, General Schneider. General Izutsu? 
Yes, uh, regarding uh, uh, communication line between our Koku Jetai or our uh, safety force with uh, peer, uh, people, Republic Army, Air Force, or not, uh, we don't have that, unfortunately. And actually, uh, Japan and uh, China, uh, we only have very limited uh, personal uh, interaction. For instance, uh, Sasagawa Foundation, which is a private foundation, uh, let send a uh, little younger officer to China and to visit their bases. And may, four years ago or so, when I was a commander of Western Air Force located in Kyushu, Fukuoka Prefecture, we accepted the delegate of China's uh, People Republic Army uh, generals to Japan. Uh, actually, they are very notable, but uh, just uh, only uh, within the scope of conf uh, confidence building. Uh, that's the uh, current situation uh, between uh, China and Japanese military uh, interaction. Thank you. Um, so we have also, we have increasingly talking more and more about China, but let's not forget there is something, uh, some other country called North Korea, who has been extremely provocative of the over the uh, last several years. So in light of that, um, how, um, how do you feel that uh, to your your two two services have been um, responding to the uh, more belligerent uh, missile threats from uh, North Korea and their uh, provocative behaviors? And uh, Tacking on to that question, have either of your service detect increased level of cooperation between cooperation or coordination between um, China and North Korea in terms of uh, provocative behavior around the uh, around the area surrounding Japan? I'm sorry to always ask uh, General Snyder to go first, but if I can ask you to do the honor again. <laughs> You're going to keep doing that till I get a till I get an answer right. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess to the second part of, of the question, and you haven't watched this uh, again from PACAP and PACOM and then Indo PACOM, the, the relationship between uh, Beijing and Pyongyang is um, I don't know it, it, that too is somewhat episodic based on the you know the, the conditions or the or, or what's going on. I do not. Again, personal opinion. Do not see that necessarily as a as a close uh, relationship. It, I, I would no no way describe it as a true alliance. Uh, but I do see Beijing, you know, wanting to keep the status quo on the peninsula. The the fact that you know actions out of uh, the DPRK they can tie down, tie up, or otherwise uh, constrain resources from the United States or the global community that focus on the peninsula uh, allow. Beijing opportunities elsewhere uh, in the world. So it's a, it's a relationship of convenience. I would describe it at that. I don't necessarily see that getting stronger or, or more solid, but I think that's one where the, the levers and are controlled uh, in, in such a way that uh, Beijing looks for opportunities where DPR provocations benefit them up to a point and that point is crisis on the peninsula does not benefit anybody. Uh, so I do see that that is, uh, that is probably one of the limits of the red lines um, in, in terms of that particular relationship. And then in terms of the, you know, the missile, the growing missile threat, yes, you know, we are in, both the US and Japan continue to, to look at that closely, both in, in the capability of our defensive systems. Do we need to make advancements? Do we need to make changes? Uh, both either their interceptors or, or missiles or positioning um, and th those discussions are, are continue to, to to develop but there is clear recognition that the, the dprk missile program did not stop uh, and it has only continued to advance in the last couple of years thank you thank you um general izutsu um while you answer the question that on the uh, um north korea and the China North Korea military cooperation. And since we're rapidly approaching the last uh, three minutes of the session, um, let me just ask you the uh, one last question that I would like you to answer um, to the extent possible. General Schneider talked about complementary capabilities or um, mutually supportive capabilities moving forward 
uh, between JASF and United States Air Force. Would um, this is um, F2 replacement program, do you think might be the um, appropriate um, program to start um, in that direction? where um, US and Japan not necessarily always buying the same stuff, but uh, mutually supporting each other's mission. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Actually, uh, the US Air Force and Koku Jitai uh, uh, has been side by side. And actually, uh, using uh, the same or similar equipment and weapon is very, very important uh, from the point of uh, interoperability. But uh, as uh, Tatsumi san pointed out, we shouldn't be, uh, everything shouldn't be the same. For instance, uh, we don't have uh, strategic bombers and or uh, like uh, 18 attackers. And uh, F2 replacement is maybe fifth generation and the further uh, brand new and state-of-the-art technology uh, fighter aircraft. But uh, maybe a little, uh, a little bit different from the US uh, fighter jets. But anyway, uh, you pointed that or uh, complement each other is very, very important. Why we have been cooperate, uh, we have been cooperated uh, very, very closely. Great, thank you. Harking back at you, uh, General Schneider, um, how do you do? You, how do you see the um, evolution of a uh, China-Russia cooperation? Um, their naval vessels coordinating maneuver around the Japanese archipelago has recently attracted big media attention here in the United States. But uh, do you see that also as a kind of a relationship of convenience, as you alluded to when, when you described uh, China North Korea? I, I do. Um, and I realize time is limited and I won't, won't be able to babble too long. You know, I, I, they will do things. My perception is they'll do things together, um, but they are going to be limited by probably some mutual distrust and a few other things um, it, politically that may prevent them. But militarily, their their participation in, in each other's exercises from time to time, as well as some combined air activities, uh, should give us reason reason for pause. But there's usually a a more uh, a larger or overriding political reason behind these exercises, again, uh, that, that probably outweighs a, a true desire for interoperability or, or further greater military cooperation on a scale that we enjoy between the US and Japan on a daily basis. Over. Thank you. And uh, I want to be respectful of uh, both generals' time. And uh, it, is, it is now 9.01. Eastern Eastern Daylight Saving Time, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, Japan Standard Time. So I would like, and I'm my apologies to those of you whose questions uh, that I could not get to. Uh, we could have just con continued this conversation another hour and there still will be more questions. So um, hopefully I would like to have a future opportunity to welcome back maybe um, each of you respectfully in a separate session to do a more of a deep dive in one, some of those uh, areas that we discussed. But again, um, thank you very much, uh, General Izutsu and Lieutenant General Schneider and joining us today. Is, uh, General Izutsu, thank you for delaying your um, bedtime for this. <laughs> and uh, thank you, General Schneider, for waking up extra early to uh, start your day. And thank you everyone for joining in on this session. Um, thank you again for everyone uh, participating and this concludes the uh, webinar.